five, four. Hello and welcome to the Interdigital Innovation Challenge. We are meeting here today with members of the Airshark team for our video chat segment of the competition. Joining me today are Suman Banerjee. Hello, Suman. And with him is his teammate, Ashish Patro. Hi. We look forward to hearing from you today. We'll begin with a five-minute presentation from your team and then follow that with 10 to 15 minutes of questions from our team here at Cal IT2 at the University of California, San Diego. Joining us from our end is our director, Ramesh Rao, who is also one of the competition judges. And then I see we have also participating Monisha Ghosh, who is a principal engineer at Interdigital. So uh, following the questions from Cal IT2, we'll open it up to Mon Monisha and anyone else who, who would like to ask questions for about 10 to 15 minutes. So let's begin with your five-minute presentation, Team Airshark. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Shaman Banerjee. I'm a professor in computer science at UW-Madison, and I have with me Ashish Patro, who's my student and a member of the Airshark team. So today I'm going to tell you, um, can the slides move? Do I have control of the slides? I believe you do. Yes. How do I? Okay, there you go. Thank you. So uh, today I'm going to tell you about Airshark, which is really a wireless interference debugging toolkit. More specifically, Airshark is a standalone software-only toolkit that allows a Wi-Fi device, let's say a laptop or a mobile tablet or an access point, to detect non-Wi-Fi activity in its vicinity and also quantify the impact of such interferers that are in the vicinity. So for example, if you have an analog phone or a Bluetooth headset or game controllers, or even a microwave oven that's causing interference to the Wi-Fi device, we can, using Airshark, have the Wi-Fi device understand that they are existing nearby and can are causing a certain amount of interference to them. Now, here is a quick snapshot of the system that we have already built. On the left side, you see a real-time spectrum waterfall but the interesting part is on the right, where you actually see the, uh, the number of devices that are being detected. In this example, there were two devices, a microwave oven and a Bluetooth device that were being detected simultaneously. That is, both are operating together, and we are actually being able to pick them up separately, and we can do this in real time. So this is actually the core capability of the system that we have already built. Now, we all know RF interference is a significant challenge, and this is especially true in unlicensed bands where there are tons of technologies that try to coexist, coexist, compete, and sometimes cause unwanted interference across each other in uncontrolled ways. And this often is a pain point for effective wireless network management. And so we believe that Airshark can significantly help in addressing this particular challenge. So if you look at the current landscape of solutions that are out there, you'll see that most of them are based on custom hardware. Uh, essentially, they're custom spectrum analyzers. And usually, you would need to add a USB dongle with the spectrum analyzer onto your laptop. And that can sometimes be cumbersome. The devices may not be widely available or may not be accessible to everybody. So in contrast, Airshark is very interesting because it is Wi-Fi based. It's built on top of existing Wi-Fi drivers. You do not need any additional hardware. And the good news is that Wi-Fi exists everywhere. Every laptop, tablet, iPod, access points, they all have Wi-Fi. And I contend that even Mr. Spock's tripod uh, has a Wi-Fi. So we can get Airshark to run on all these devices very easily and have them understand interference properties at every single point across the world. So what was hard about this effort? So the challenge really we had to encounter was Wi-Fi cards were not meant to be spectrum analyzers. Their behavior is limited by the 802.11 specs. They cannot simultaneously sense a wide spectrum, both in time and frequency. And we've also needed to create signatures with this limited view of the spectrum and infer various properties. And finally, we needed to offer it at line speed. So we have actually developed algorithmic techniques based on the limited view Wi-Fi cards provide us to achieve detection ability that was necessary for this work. Instead of going into the gory details of how the system was specifically built, we will focus on experimental results that we have done with a large plethora of non-Wi-Fi devices. And I'll give you two quick snapshots. First result that we show is essentially that across a large range of devices, 
we get very high accuracy in correctly detecting that they are actually in the vicinity, even when the signal strength of these devices are relatively low, let's say less than minus 80 dBm. And in addition, when there are multiple of them operating simultaneously, let's say a Bluetooth device and a Zigbee device and a video camera, we can still detect them pretty accurately with very low false positives. Uh, today we are trying, getting ready to release Airshark tool for a beta release. Uh, we believe we can release this as a standalone software, but we're also exploring an OEM style licensing opportunity with AP vendors as well as client side vendors, and we are releasing this software in two different operating systems in the near future. And our next step would be to really build a comprehensive wireless network management toolkit, and Airshark can be a significant step towards this vision, and it's already a standalone tool that we can make available to everybody. Now, we believe that the wireless network management market is pretty significant in size. There is a lot of activity in this, a lot of need in this, and a lot of technical challenges as well. And we believe that a tool like Airshark can be fundamental because this is a tool that works on Wi-Fi only, and no other tool exists that are uh, sort of a peer to this tool, and so it can be significant in many ways. Uh, we are also filing patents on this, and that would provide us with suitable protection for this technology. We were happy to see that we got a lot of press coverage uh, for our work in many different public forums. So there's a lot of uh, appreciation for the work we have done, and we believe we can take it further along in, in the next few months. And finally, I would like to conclude by showing you a brief demo. The demo will essentially show that we have integrated Airshark with an existing access point. Uh, you will see four different uh, non-Wi-Fi devices, two different phones, cordless phones, a Bluetooth device, and, um, and, a, uh, and a Zigbee device. And in this particular screen, you will see that as each device gets detected, not only do we detect it, so you'll see a line corresponding to it, but you also see the signal strength at which this device, non-Wi-Fi device, is operating. So that will give you a sense of the interference impact that device is causing to the Wi-Fi device. So with that, I'll turn it over to the video demo, which I think uh, our host will help play. And as the video is playing, I'll be happy to take questions. OK, please stand by. In this demo, we are going to present our system Airshark. Airshark basically uses a Wi-Fi card and tries to detect different non-Wi-Fi devices that are present in the spectrum. So in this setup that you are able to see, we have an access point, and this access point is connected to the controller over the Ethernet. Now once we turn on the wireless card, this wireless
Okay, Simon, can you hear me? Explain the background mm -hmm. because it just shows that it works and there's a lot of nice. The video is also on the website so people can take a look at it instead of playing it through here. Hello again. Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Hello. I know I can't. No, nothing's turned off. Just stand by. We're having a, an audio difficulty. Mm -hmm. I'm not muted. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. No. I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Um, so we will add your video to our website so that everyone can view it after the fact. Right. We apologize for the technical difficulties. So if you want to take a moment to explain what was happening in the video for everyone who's listening, please go ahead and do so. Okay. Yeah. So the video basically shows that we had actually integrated this software with an access point as well. And it, it will, of course, come in a standalone version, but it was also integrated into an access point. And we were trying to show that it was actually able to detect the different non-Wi-Fi devices using no additional hardware but just the Wi-Fi card in the access point. And the video shows, you know, it w works with different types of devices. It works when multiple devices are operating simultaneously. It can still detect them apart, and it can say what is the signal strength from each different device. So you can actually discern these things very nicely. And uh, this is the same video or a bridge version of it's already in the I2C website. So feel free to browse that and, you know, look at it and understand, you know, how it actually works in real life. Sure. Um, so I didn't want to go on for five minutes right now. So maybe okay. Our viewers can see the video on Airshark submission page at i2c.calit2.net. And my first question to you is, out of curiosity, how did you come up with the name Airshark? <laughs> uh, very good question. So actually, there is a tool that's very widely used in the wireless networking community. It's called Wireshark. And the goal of the tool is to basically take a look at what Wi-Fi packets are being sent. And it gives you uh, analysis of that. The, the name shark is used uh, just, uh, uh, I think, for various reasons, but it's wire that is, it, it, in fact, it was used for both wired and wireless packet analysis. So because it's called wire shark, we kind of changed that, or had a play on the name and called it air shark because we are picking up RF activities from the air. I see. Okay. And who would you say is your primary customer, or if you have one, more than one customer, who are your customers? Would it be a consumer, another a, a wireless customer? Yeah, good question. So I see at least three different potential customers or three different market segments. It depends on us which one we want to focus on first. The first one would be um, uh, sort of hobbyists as well as enterprise administrators, people who want to use this tool to understand what's wrong with their wireless environment. Anybody can use it at home and say, you know, maybe my microwave is causing me problems. How do I fix this? I need to use this tool to understand it. And I don't need to go and get an expensive spectrum analyzer. I can just use the Wi-Fi card in my laptop or in my mobile tablet to figure this out. That's number one. But other sort of uh, commercially, there are two other segments that are probably interesting. One is access point vendors, companies like Cisco, Aruba, Meru, uh, Meraki, there's lots of companies, they make access points and they could potentially integrate the software in their access points to learn about interference that the access points and clients are facing and then take some actions to prevent them. And the third segment is, of course, uh, the clients themselves. So my laptop could use this to detect these things just to improve the laptop's experience uh, directly. So it could work with a Microsoft Windows OS or a Mac OS or Linux or something like that. So depending on how we take this forward, these are the three different market segments for us. Okay, so between now and having your product get into the hands of Cisco or Apple or my grandmother, what needs to happen? What, my, what milestones do you still need to make happen in terms of development and commercial um, right. viability? So we are actually, we expect in the next couple of months, I think, be able to release a beta version of the standalone system. So we can actually, we will probably be putting it up on our website. People can download it, use it, play with it, uh, and analyze things. So that's actually very, very soon, in my opinion. Um, for it to get integrated to, a, uh, to an access point vendor, that requires us to work with an access point vendor and port a little bit of our code into the access point infrastructure 
we have had some very initial interests, but we want to explore that more and we need to do some engineering to integrate. But uh, at a conceptual level, it should be pretty easy given that our standalone system already runs on multiple operating systems. Okay. As you were developing Airshark, what were some of the failures that you ran into and what did you learn in overcoming them? Absolutely. So I think the first big challenge we had to encounter was that uh, even across different Bluetooth devices, for example, they're not exactly the same. They have slight differences from each other. And being able to detect all Bluetooth devices consistently is a difficult thing to do because of these differences. And we had to kind of make some assumptions and we kind of had to experiment with many different manufacturers and vendors trying to understand how do we identify the common set of features that identify Bluetooth as a whole but not get confused by different types of Bluetooth devices. That was one kind of challenge. The other was sort of looking at whether there are environmental effects within a building that may uh, lead to poor results. And so we did a lot of experiments in different scenarios. And I think we have come up with very robust techniques by now to kind of deal with these issues by experimenting and refining our techniques. Okay. So now that you've overcome some of those issues, what remains your product's greatest weakness? Um, so one of the things we would like to do would be to basically work at a much lower level that is work directly on the Wi-Fi chip uh, and uh, probably with a Wi-Fi chip manufacturer, companies like Qualcomm, companies like uh, uh, Broadcom. And of course, uh, it would be great if our software can run at that level. Um, I think some of the challenges there would be to make sure, uh, firstly, is a non-technical but a logistical challenge as to how software can be pushed down to that level and how to port this code at that level. Um, and then kind of setting up some partnerships with them to make that uh, a reality. Because if we have this as a core capability of every Wi-Fi chip right at the onset, then you can build a huge ecosystem out of it. Right now we are probably living a little bit higher up the stack where it's, uh, uh, it's still pretty efficient, but it's not an integrated part of every Wi-Fi chip. So we can probably push it there in the future. Okay. I'm going to take a question from one of our chat participants. This is Monisha Ghosh of Interdigital. Mm -hmm. And she has a three part, actually a two part question. The first part, and we will be displaying these questions in the video chat screen so you can read them and refer to them. The first part is how long does it take for the interference to be detected and or classified? And the follow up question is where do you see possible improvements in the future? And you might have just answered that question, but feel free to elaborate. Sure. So how long it takes to um, uh, do the initial interference detection is actually very quick. It's less than a second, often of the order of 100 milliseconds or so. So it's actually very useful because even if you're walking, moving, and as your interference is dynamically changing on you, you can still track it, and you can actually do some interesting things with that. Um, and then, uh, sorry, what was the second part? The it's challenge. It's displayed in the chat window. Um, where do you see possible improvements in the future? Oh, yes. So I think, you know, with any technique like this, you know, we get pretty high accuracies. We are probably in the 95 to 98% range. Mm -hmm. I think you can always uh, improve things like this. You can make it more robust, maybe get closer to 100%. Achieving 100% is probably very hard, but you want to get the accuracies much higher. And then the other question could be, you know, uh, and may not be directly related to Airshark per se, but, you know, can we do this for other types of devices, other wireless devices, not necessarily Wi-Fi? And then look at, you know, could they collaborate in some way across multiple device types? So I think there are a lot of things to be done next. Um, the specific technique, I would say, I can still see a few opportunities for improvement uh, in accuracy. Okay. A, a question from our director, Ramesh Rao, one of the competition judges. Mm -hmm. Have you been able to assess the accuracy of the Airshark estimates of power levels? Uh, yes. So from the, pro you, 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 the, I am assuming it's from the processing standpoint as to how much power this system consumes. I'm going to interpret the question. Uh, he, Dr. Rao will clarify his question. Let's skip to another question in the meantime. Uh, have you had a chance, if you had a chance to look at the other submissions in the competition, what would you say makes your proposal stand out most distinctly? Yeah, so I think what's very unique about our, pro what is unique about our solution is that it's a very practical and very required problem. As we all know, Wi-Fi is a growing phenomenon. I mean, it's already very big. There are billions of devices that ship today, and the interference in wireless environments is getting bigger and bigger. And as 
it's one of the fundamental problems today as devices increase, they all come with Wi-Fi. And everybody's trying to ship more video, more traffic, and the interference issue is getting worse. And the worst part of this scenario is that if you look at enterprise networks, for example, you see more and more sophisticated tools to deal with problems in the enterprise wired side. But equivalent tools in the wireless side is much less. And I talk to our local administrators all the time, and they always complain that it's very hard to understand what's wrong. And we had this long thread of emails across our administrators and their uh, frustrations that people report a problem. By the time they show up, the problem's gone. They can't know. They don't know what to do. And they need real-time tools that can exactly tell them how to deal with this problem. So I think the problem is both very important, it's getting bigger, and we need to address the problem now because otherwise wireless enterprises are becoming a pipe dream and not a reality. And of okay. course, there's a big market opportunity around uh, what we see from different vendors. Okay. Um Another question for you from Loni Shabosh. Mm -hmm. Can the interference detection algorithm work during Wi-Fi transmissions? Absolutely. So in fact, we, we have an extended version of the system that's currently on, in the works where we observe Wi-Fi transmissions going in tandem with non-Wi-Fi activity. And then we can even more certainly accurately pinpoint that this non-Wi-Fi transmission is causing problems to this Wi-Fi transmission. So yes. But you probably, in that case, need a second Wi-Fi card to uh, observe because the first one's busy transferring. And there are many access points which actually can do that because many access points today come with not just two, but sometimes with up to 16 Wi-Fi radios all in the single Wi-Fi access point system. And there are two or three of them dedicated for monitoring which could implement AirShark, and the rest of it could be transmitting and receiving data. So yes, it can work that way. Okay, and a clarification on Dr. Rao's question. Have you been able to compare our sh AirShark's estimates with other direct over-the-air measurement of transmitted power? And we'll place that question in the video chat box, too, so you can read it yourself. Okay. Um, I think uh, I didn't have the chat box open. Maybe that's why I didn't see it. Um, uh, Yes, so we have actually compared it to a bunch of different techniques. In particular, um, we have looked at, and I don't know if it's fair to name them, but let me just say that we have looked at at least um, three different other competitor products, and we have actually spoken, personally spoken to two of them. And uh, what I can tell you is that um, uh, both of them use dedicated spectrum analyzer hardware for doing what we do. Right, so we have less hardware capability and less uh, flexibility in the way we operate. Yet, our accuracy in both in one case was actually better. We were able to give better performance and accuracy in detection. And in the other case, it was very similar. In some cases, it was slightly better for us. In other cases, it was slightly better for them. And uh, but we are using Wi-Fi cards, so it's actually more ubiquitous. So I think there's a huge advantage. So obviously, uh, after our conversations and results. They have been talking to us to figure out, you know, whether there's an opportunity to do something. Uh, but we did have a lot of comparisons, and some of them are even described in our technical paper that was published in the recent months. Thank you. And assuming that your product makes it onto the marketplace and is implemented widely, how do you see it changing the face of wireless in the next five to ten years? Absolutely. Very good question. So I think, um, you know, for the last decade, I would say, wireless Wi-Fi systems have improved quite a lot. People have understood how to deal with interference from one Wi-Fi source that has impact on another Wi-Fi source. If one laptop's talking and downloading video, what's the impact of that on another laptop trying to do, say, web browser? But understanding how non-Wi-Fi devices have impact on Wi-Fi systems has been very poorly understood. Our tool can actually empower access point vendors to address this next set of challenges. We have gone and spoken to a couple of uh, AP vendors, and everybody said, yeah, Wi-Fi to Wi-Fi interference we understand, but we don't have any clue of how to deal with non-Wi-Fi interference. So if you can give us a tool that can expose this nicely, we can then take up strategies and mitigate this interference. We can design systems that can avoid interference in intelligent ways. That can be a significant gain because it will help limit amount of interference in the environment. It will enable all these, you know, applications that are coming in, lots of videos and all kinds of audio and other applications that are going to flood the wireless market. Some of it is getting interference limited today, 
will will actually not be limited anymore because of technologies like we are. Okay, and we have about three minutes remaining, so let's take another question from Monisha Ghosh at InterDigital. Mm -hmm. Her question is, Wi-Fi allows channel changes when packet error rates are too high on the operating channel. Have you quantified how much better Airshark is compared to the standard techniques? And does the additional classification of the interference really help in improving the network throughput? Again, this is displayed in the chat box. Yes, thank you. So I think that's a very good question. We have actually been talking to one of the AP vendors to quantify exactly this issue. And one of the things that we have observed is that if you, it is true that Wi-Fi access points can change their channel of operation. But if you look at the reality of most access points, uh, they try not to change channels, channels of operation very frequently because every time you change channel, you have to make sure all your clients can move to the same channel with you. And many clients do not do it right. And so even the ones that do change channels of operation, they do it at a coarse granularity order of at least hours, right? So uh, we are actually demonstrating this to one of the AP vendors, showing that by knowing what kind of interference sources exist, sometimes you may choose to not change channels, and sometimes you may choose to change channels. And quantifying the impact really honestly depends on the scenario. For example, if you have a microwave on, uh, I can tell you that you know you will get zero throughput in some cases, and the only way to deal with that is change your channel. Uh, there are many other examples, so it de really depends on individual scenarios, and we have seen many scenarios where by detecting the type of device that's operating near you, you can actually intelligently decide to switch channel or not. For example, if it's an analog phone, we can predict something about it and decide, okay, switching channel is a bad idea because the phone call usually lasts this much, and often we can also coexist with certain kinds of devices better than others, even though there is some packet loss behavior that's there. So we have some quantification numbers ourselves that we have shared with the AP vendors, and definitely they, they appreciate why this is a useful thing. Also realizing that access points, while they can switch channels, they try not to do it too frequently because it's considered very disruptive. Okay, well, it looks like we've run out of time unless there is a pressing question someone participating would like to ask and place in the chat box quickly. I think we'll wrap up the Q&A session with Airshark. Thank you so much for participating, and we look forward to seeing more about your proposal in the weeks to come. Best of luck to you, and we will talk with you soon. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone who was on the call. Thanks. Bye. Bye.